Let's stand because we cannot do that without God's word. Today, our text of scripture is Esther chapter 6, and it reads like this. On that night, the king could not sleep, and he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written how Mordecai had told about Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, who guarded the threshold and who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And the king said, what honor or distinction has been bestowed upon Mordecai for this? The king's young men who attended him said, nothing has been done for him. And the king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's young men told him, Haman is there standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. So Haman came in and the king said to him, what should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? And Haman said to himself, whom would the king delight no honor more than me? And Haman said to the king, for the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set. And let the robes and the horse be handed over to the one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them lead him the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Then the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. So Haman took the robes and the horse, and he dressed Mordecai and led him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate. But Haman hurried to his house, mourning and with his head covered. And Haman told his wife Zeresh and all of his friends everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but you will surely fall before him. This is the word of the Lord. All right. You guys go ahead and have a seat. And, and if you do have your copy of, of God's word, your, your Bible, go ahead and get to Esther 6. Uh, we encourage that at, at Life Point Church, a, a bringing of the Bible. But we'll have the text up here today too. But um, in, in 2012, you guys don't know me too much. Some of you do because you came from the creek. But um, in 2012... Um, I was an operations manager of a health club in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, that was my full-time vocation. Um, I was also serving as a middle school leader in student ministry at LifePoint. And uh, we had just uh, gone to a camp whatever of that year. And I came home from camp that year. And I had decided that I was going to leave uh, my job, my marketplace job, for what I felt was a call upon my life for full-time vocational ministry. And I, I did that. I, I jumped in and over at the Stewart Street campus as the student and associate uh, minister over there. Uh, and then shortly after I got seated and, and had changed my whole life for this, shortly after our pastor abruptly and unfortunately left the ministry and so we were sitting there as a fairly young church we had uh we were sheep without a shepherd and this were dark uh, desperate times for our church and so we went on to uh we proceeded with a a pastor search for the next man and it took nine months all right so nine months would take off and um, I served during that nine months as the interim pastor over there, never once thinking that they should consider me for the job because I am, uh, my religious resume says, don't hire this guy, right? Don't stay away from this guy. You don't want him. He's green. He's just in here. And so uh, I, I just prayed God would send us a, a pastor alongside of everybody else in the church. 
Nine months, these dudes come in. Somebody just, it just doesn't work. And I'm just telling you what, after nine months of being the interim over there, and I was not only serving as the interim pastor, I was still doing my student ministry responsibilities on Wednesdays and Sundays and Sunday, I mean, all of these things. If I'm being completely honest, I really felt in that season that God was absent. I, I, I'm stretched. I'm struggling. My wife is. My family are. We're, we're just thinking God is like a million miles away right now. He's unconcerned with what's happening. He's surely not responding on the timeline that I think he should be responding on. I I saw no so-called good in my life or in the church at this time. I'm just being honest with you. That's what it felt like during this time, questioning a lot of things, doubting the goodness of God. Then one day, I, uh, I was having a meeting with Pat, our senior pastor, and Kyle Gowen, at that time, who was the associate pastor, and I was giving them a, just an update on th- how things were going at the creek. And I came in, I'm just kind of, hey, things are really rough right now. Hey, I mean, they're dark and it's really hard right now. When are you going to send a deliverer to the creek, guys? When are y'all going to get your stuff together and find us a pastor? And they shocked me and they looked at me and they said, what about you? We, we've kind of been talking, we've been uh, watching, we've been considering these nine months and and we we kind of think that maybe god has you here for such a time as this you're just kind of at the right place at the right time and so we we think you should become the pastor of the church and i i I hesitated i balked because it's a very costly and an awesome burden but but I, i i i paused and then eventually began to pray through that and process that and then took the position as campus pastor at Life Point Stewart's Creek. That was 11 years ago. And, uh, and they haven't kicked me out yet, by the way. I'm still, still over there. Uh, but, but see, here's the deal. In the middle of that, I saw no good. I felt the absence of God, questioned, doubted. Now, looking back on it after this happened, now I can see God wasn't absent. He was present the whole time. He was working an unseen plan for my good. This is what is called God's providence. That's what it looks like. That's a story of what the providence of God looks like. The book of Esther is all about God's providence, which is a little ironic when you think about it. You know, the book of Esther is not about Esther. I don't know if you thought that. The book of Esther is not about Esther. It's a book about God and his providence, which is another ironic thing because his name isn't even mentioned in the book, right? Why in the world would God not put his name in the book other than the fact he didn't want it in there? That's the first reason right there. He just didn't want it in there. But I think the reason that God's name is not in this book is because he knows and we know also there are times in our life where it feels God is absent. Times when life smacks you in the mouth. It's time uh, that feels life is very dark. You're desperate, full of despair, pain, sorrow. Unexplicable times in our life feels like God is a million miles away could be a, a prodigal child or not having a child, could be a bad marriage, a broken, busted up family, a breakup, a job loss, a loss of a loved one. There is moments all throughout our lives where it feels that God is absent. And certainly by looking at the world and our very own country today, wouldn't you agree that it can very much feel like God is absent? I mean, in a world that that calls good evil and calls evil good, ah, it feels like God's a million miles away, right? This is the reality of our country. We see this. It feels like the universe is just kind of randomly running on its own. Or it feels like everything is just up to, to chance, to karma or to coincidence or worse that everything's left up to total human control it's a scary thought 
But here's the deal. It's not true. It's never true. And don't ever believe it. (laughs) Because the book of Esther shows us who God is. Unseen, but still sovereign. Moving his invisible hand throughout history. And also intervening in humans' lives. People like you and me. Working a tireless good in our lives. Surely goodness will follow us all of our days for his people, right? Those who love God and are called according to his purpose in the name of Jesus. That's Romans 8, 28. For all of those people, God is working a good in all situations and everything for his people. That is is called God's providence. That's why our today's message title is Confidence in God's Providence. That's what we're going to talk about today. Because Esther 6 is just another example of why we can have confidence in his providence. Now, what we're going to do today, I'm going to walk through the narrative here, because this is a narrative. We're going to walk through the story. If you've missed any parts of the story, you can always go back on the app. You can kind of catch up and kind of stay along with the church. Uh, but I, want to, I think we can see evidence in chapter 6 of his providence. And then at the end, I've got just two points that, that I think if we believe in God's providence, it'll help us do a couple of things. So we'll look at that. But let's look at where we have been Thus far, the scene set for chapter 6. Haman, Haman the horrible, he hated Mordecai the Jew. And so what he did is he, he, he refused to show him honor. Mordecai refused to show him honor. So, so Haman concocted a plot to kill Mordecai and all of Mordecai's people, all of the Jews. This was like the Old Testament purge the purge right it's a it's like a holocaust of satanic proportions that went all the way back to genesis 3 15 it's where it started and so after this edict to to genocide all of the jews was signed by the king now it's said you've got mordecai is mourning tear his clothes he's tore up and so he goes to queen esther his foster daughter slash cousin who providentially was queen, and he goes to her, he says, hey, Esther, you got to do something about this. you got to get in the king's ear and stop this edict from passing. And, and she hesitated because she knew if you went into the king's palace without being summoned, her head could get cut off. So she hesitated. We, we would probably hesitate too, right? I think we would. And so she hesitated there, and then Mordecai challenged her and he tells her really the most famous line in the whole book of chapter 4, 14. You've been placed here for such a time as this. That's the theme, one of the themes of our study. So she agreed. She accepted the challenge from Mordecai. And she went to the king of kings first. She prayed. She fasted, went to the king of kings. And then she went to King Ahasuerus because she was going to form a strategy on how she was going to do this. She went into the palace and she invited him and Haman to a feast. So she didn't just kind of run in and blast and ask away. She had a strategy for what she was doing. And so she's at the feast and uh, while they're there, the king asked her two times, what is it that you request? And two times he offered up half of his kingdom. But here's the deal about Esther. She was selfless and sacrificial. She didn't want the king's possessions and she didn't want power. She wanted her people. That's what she wanted. And so what she does is is she says, hey, come back tomorrow. I'm going to do another dinner party. And if you come back tomorrow, then I'm going to share with you what I'm my request. All right. So that's the setup there. And on the way out, King Ahasuerus said, Haman, leave. And on the way out, Haman sees that old dang Mordecai sitting by the gate again 
and he just refuses to bow, refuses to honor. Haman get, gets that wrath up inside of him. He goes home. He's telling his wife, you know, I got all this stuff. I got power. I've got accolades. I've got assets. I've got all this stuff. But you know what? None of it means anything. I just want to see Mordecai dead. And they look at him. They say, hey, man. That's a, I don't know if you caught that real quick. They say, hey, man, why don't you just build some gallows tonight and we'll have We'll have Mordecai hanged in the morning. All right, let's just go to the king and just kill him tomorrow. Hang him, right? And the idea pleased, he pleased Haman. So that's what he did. And that's kind of where chapter 5 ended. This is where you pick up today. So Haman, think about this. He's up all night. He's building the gallows. He's ready. He's so geeked up. He's so excited because the next morning he's going into the king and he's going to request that Mordecai be hanged. He's up all night. But it just so happened, while he was up all night concocting a plan to kill Mordecai, the king, King Ahasuerus, was also up all night because we're told he could not sleep. Couldn't sleep. We've all been there before, right? Middle of the night, minds racing, tossing, turning. We're trying to turn the TV on. We're taking a Tylenol PM, maybe we're listening to some tunes. We're trying to do things to go back to sleep, but nothing seems to work. And that's kind of the place that we see Ahasuerus in, can't go to sleep. And it just so happened, right, that this story just kind of rolls out like this. So how's the king going to get back to sleep? He could drink a warm glass of milk. He could call in a honey from his harem. She would probably put him back to sleep, if you know what I mean. Uh, he, he could probably get his, one of his guys to come in and play a harp, and, and, and they could just kind of like drift off back to sleep. That, that's not what he does. Of all things to get back to sleep, the king says, hey, bring me that book, that book of memorable, memorable deeds, the chronicles that records all of the history and the king. Just read that book. Maybe that will put me back to sleep. It's probably he's trying to bore himself back to sleep, right? It just so happens that of all the books in the king's royal library that he chooses the one book that contains the story of when Mordecai uncovered the plot to kill the king by the two eunuchs, Bigthana and Teresh. By the way, you want to talk about unfortunate names? Big Thana? I mean, like, please don't name your babies Big Thana. It's probably not good. But that's, that's the book they pick up. It's crazy that this book, of all the books, is the one that he grabs. It just so happens, not only did the young men grab that book, but they just so happened to read the specific story out loud of what Mordecai did. He hears it. He's like, wow, what? Did I do anything to honor this man? Like, what happened here? What, what has been done to Mordecai to honor him for this great things? His young man said, nothing. You didn't do anything to honor him at all. King says, we got to fix this right now. We got to do something about it. King gets up early. As soon as the sun rises, he gets in the office. He's ready to figure some things out here. And guess who's just so happened to be there early in the morning too? Haman. Haman got up earlier than anybody else because he's so hyped up to come in to hang Mordecai. And all of a sudden, the king, he's trying to honor Mordecai. There's a lot of dynamics that are happening here. So uh, he asks his men, who's in the palace? King Hashuerus, who's in the palace? I need some counsel because the king can't make any decisions on his own, right? And so he calls in. They said, Haman's here. He said, bring Haman in right now. Haman charges in. He looks at Haman. He says, what should be done to the man who honors the king? Notice he says, what should be done to the man? He didn't say what should be done to honor Mordecai. He says to the man. So Haman doesn't have a clue. 
He, he is very proud and presumptuous, though, isn't he? Haman, we've learned a lot about him. So with his big head and his big mouth, he, he assumes he's talking about himself. Who, who else is he talking about to honor but me? He's got to be talking about me, right? That's what he says. He says, I, I got a great idea, king. Here's what we should do. Let the royal robes of the king be put on this man. Put him on the king's horse, king's crown, and then parade this man around the town. Take one of the highest, most noble officials, and, and as he's going around town, just proclaim and shout out loud, this is what the king does to those who honor him. He says, that's what we should do for this man. The king says, great idea, Haman. Here's what we're going to do. The man that needs to be honored here, his name is Mordecai the Jew, and the man who's going to parade him around town and put on the robes and shout his name, honoring him in the city, it's now you, Haman. Did you, like, just think for a minute. This is like one of the biggest jaw drops in the Bible. You have to remember the setting of what's happening here. Haman didn't get up early to come honor Mordecai. He came to get up early to come hang Mordecai, right? He was preparing the gallows, not trying to parade him around town. And so this is this story is just, it's crazy. It's crazy. By the way, I, I, I don't know. The text doesn't show us if like, like they were talking to each other around the town. He's parading him. I don't know what's going on, but I would like to think Mordecai was probably rubbing it in Haman's face a little bit. <laughs> this is awesome. Do you see what's happening here? Haman, I can't believe this. Hey, I'll tell you what, Haman, can you shout out that thing again? You know, that thing that you say, this is what's done to the man who honors the king. Just keep praising my name. Do it again, right? It's probably just this banter back and forth, but uh, it's crazy how this story is just unfolding. The one who exalted himself is now being humbled and the one who's been humble is being exalted textbook example of what jesus said in luke 14 look at it for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted this is playing out right here so after verse 12 through 13 after haman had paraded Mordecai around town shouting his name and all of these things. It says that he, uh, he went home. He went home and he tucked tail, basically, is what he did. He's so mad. And he, and he gets home, he gets to the house, and he, he's telling uh, Zeresh, his wife, and his, his young men, um, telling them what happened. And it's, it's ironic that pagans here, these people don't believe in Jesus, but they, they recognize that there's this power and this presence that's protecting Mordecai and the Jews. Dang right there was, right? And so he's basically saying hey, that you, you, this, this Mordecai, if he's of the Jews, like you're never going to stop him, Haman. In fact, he's going to eventually destroy you. That's a flip of the script from chapter 5 when they said that, oh, you, you, you're going to kill Mordecai the next morning. Now they're they flip the tables. They're like, we don't know what you want to do, man. We have no idea for you here. You're going down is what they say. Again, this is an incredible story that seemingly is filled with a lot of coincidence. A lot of just so happens along the way. After all, God's name isn't mentioned here, right? So one could easily say, Esther 6, this narrative, is just full of a lot of coincidences, right? I love what C.S. Lewis says. He says, coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. All of these so-called coincidences in, in chapter 6 are really not coincidences as, at all. They are examples of God's providence. Let me see if I can help show you and prove to you that this actually is the hand of God. You know, God's not watching this narrative unfold like you and I are. He's not watching it unfold like Mordecai is and Haman. They're all just kind of in the story. He's not watching it. He's governing and moving all of these 
pieces, including people, to accomplish his purpose and his good plan. In verse 1, when it said that the king could not sleep, this is why translations are very important. You know, in the Greek translation, it says that God kept the king awake. God is sovereign over the mind of the king, and he's sovereign over day and night. Proverbs 21 one tells us that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And so what happened here is God put it in the heart and the mind of the king to read this book of all books on this specific night. He's working the plan here. He directed the young men to read the specific story about Mordecai and his plot He's orchestrating everything here from Haman to arrive at the gate early to hang Mordecai and he's stirring up the king's heart so that he would want to honor Mordecai. Again, this is a screaming right text that just says God is provident, God is provident, God is provident. What does this mean for us and this is a really old story in the Old Testament. And so you might be saying, okay, what, is, what does this mean for us? It's a great narrative. God of the Old Testament did a lot of that stuff, but I don't see him today doing stuff like this. Here's the beauty of this whole thing. The God who's behind this narrative here, working behind the curtains of the story of Esther, is the God of us. It's our same God. He is behind the curtains of our everyday lives. He's working in every situation everywhere and every place to bring about his perfect plan. If that's true, then that means there's no such thing as self-sovereignty. There really is no such thing as karma. There's really no such thing as luck or chance or coincidence. Every event of our life that we often call slip-ups, mistakes, oversights, are all explained right here for us in chapter 6. They are all under the perfect providence of God. This is supposed to be an incredible comfort, by the way. I don't know if you're there today. But this is supposed to be a comfort and a confidence for God's people. That he could be so powerful that even he can trump all of the things that have been done to us or the things that we have even done. We are very much responsible for all of those things, by the way. But at the same time, this providence of God that see working through this text is still able to do and work over all things in our life for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. He is in absolute total control of all things, history and our lives, and we can have confidence in that. Confidence in his providence. Now, there's two things, if we see, if you're tracking with me, and, and if you're not quite there, and you're kind of in that place of, well, I, I, this, this, is, this was done to me, and I did this, and you're going to tell me that God's over this too, and there's a lot of mystery when you talk about God's sovereignty and man's responsibility that I don't have time to do today. Uh, but I know that Caleb can answer all of your theological questions today when you leave. Uh, no, th there's a lot more time. We do want to help you process through those things. And so if you have questions after, we're glad to do that. But if we're tracking through and we get this confidence in the providence of God, that he's actually doing these things, there's two things that I think it, it does for us that we can see in this text. And those two things are that it kills pride and it causes patience. It kills pride and causes patience. So here's the first idea. These won't be too long here. But providence kills pride. You believe, see, and savor God's providence. It will kill our pride. Now look at 
Again, look back at, at Mordecai's situation, his, his plot here. He is hours away from death, y'all, right? He's hours away from being hanged from the gallows. And then, out of nowhere, the king can't sleep, picks up a book, recalls the story of how Mordecai saved him. And then now, he went from hours from death, he's on a horse, riding through the city he's they're screaming and proclaiming his name he's wearing the king's robe uh he's got the crown he's on the horse he's gone from this to this like i mean like this he has been he's been saved from certain death he's experienced salvation and he's also experiencing exaltation right that's what's all happening right here how did he get here? What happened to make this story turn on its head? What's the cause of his salvation? What's the cause of his exaltation? Is it a result of his hard work? I mean, like, he, did he just do a really good job and he got the job at the king's gate so he could hear the story and uncover the plot? No. <laughs> Is it because of his diligence and his skill the fact that he's the one that covered the plot by the king is that is that why he's experiencing now because mordecai is so dang awesome no it's not at all in fact mordecai hasn't really shown a whole lot in this book if we're being honest the reason he's now experiencing salvation and exaltation is only because of god's good providence in his life he has no reason to boast at all and believing in god's providence kills our pride it's the only thing it's a weapon i believe that god uses to destroy the pride inside of us pride is pride is in our old nature there's something inherent in all of us that wants recognition isn't there I, can somebody agree with me? Just one person. There you go. Okay. Something inside of us, we want, uh, we want to self-congratulate. Uh, we want to pat ourselves on the back. We want recognition for what we have done. We want other people to see it. Hey, good job. You did a good job. We want likes. We want approval. We want friends and followers. We, we're something inside of us in our sinful nature where we have this pride that's inside of us. Well, pride is not just in our nature it's also in our culture isn't it aren't we told in our culture be proud of yourself you did so good be proud i mean heck we've even dedicated a whole month to arrogant pride right the problem is even though culture celebrates pride scripture always condemns it it's evil <laughs> it's selfish inside of us. And this story, if you believe in the providence of God, it is the weapon that will kill the pride inside of us. When you read stories like this, you have evidence of it. And then if you look back in your life at some things that kind of just so happened to you, you can look back and you say, oh, wow, everything that good that's ever happened in my life was a result of God's providence. Everything. We can't take credit for a single good thing in our lives if we believe in the providence of God. It kills our pride. And if you're like wrestling to, you're, maybe you're sitting there saying, hey, I'm a Christian, but man, I don't see a lot of good at all. Do you know what God's greatest providence that he's done for you in your life? He saved you. <laughs> if that's all you have for the rest of your life as a Christian, you got that. We have that. And let us be careful to make sure that our own pride doesn't come in and say, no, I remember the day I got up. I did this. I went to church. I grasped things. I prayed that prayer that day. I got up. I, was, I did all. I, I, listen. Let me help you, or let Paul help us with Ephesians 1.11. In him, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him 
who works all things according to the counsel of his will. If you don't look at that text right there and see that your salvation, your exaltation is 100% the providence of God, you're not seeing it correctly. Go back again and again and again until that pride is killed inside of us. The last point is this. Providence produces patience. Providence produces patience. It had been five years since Mordecai uncovered that plot. So five years have gone by, right? So he probably is thinking, hey man, I've never been recognized for this, never been honored, he's just waiting, waiting, he's waiting. Maybe it's never going to come. And then hours away from his death, God put it in the heart of the king at the right time to turn the heart of the king into honoring him. If Mordecai had been honored five years earlier, like when this whole thing went down, he's probably going to get killed here. He's probably hours from death because of the genocide of all the Jews. But because he has patience at the right time, God accomplished this purpose. You know, I think we have these situations in our life where our, our patience is tried. We're waiting for that good. You know what I mean? Like you're sitting there like, where's my husband that loves Jesus? Where's my wife that loved Jesus? Will I ever have a husband or will I ever have a wife that loves Jesus? Will we ever get pregnant? Will we ever have a family like the picture that I want my family? To, will I ever have that? Will I ever have the job that fulfills my desire? Will I ever have the house? Will I ever get a glorified body? Because my body is on fumes right now. <laughs> when are we going to get a new world? I'm tired of this world and the way that it looks. When are we going to get our new world in new glory with new bodies? You see, in those moments when we are very, very impatient, if we are to look back in the scripture and in moments in our life at the providence of God, it will cause and produce the patience inside of us. We can sit there with a hope that a coming good is coming your way. It's a promise of God. So right now, just, for, just think about this for a second. You're, let's just say you're in the middle of something right now. Think through what it is. It's the storm, it's the darkness, it's the suffering, it's the unknowns right now. Whatever that is, God has promised a good is coming to you. His ways are not your ways. And you don't know what that good is going to be, but it's coming. Be patient because God's providence has promised you something good. How do we respond to this today? I've thought about a few ways. I, I know that providence produces worshipful people, confident people, comforted people. I know those are things that we should respond to. It should create a lot of worship inside of us. Uh, when, when we understand providence, we got to get put down here and he gets put up there. And isn't that where worship actually starts? The lower that we go, the higher he goes, that's where worship begins. I think the way that we respond today, I told you maybe at the beginning that all passages of scripture and every preacher should show you who God is and should also culminate all things in Christ. So if I come up here today and I don't talk about Christ, then I'm not done with my sermon yet, and, and you, you don't get the biggest need that you have. And so this story is a story of three people, okay? There is the person of God that we've talked a lot about today, the person of God, 
and he's directing all of these events in the story for the good of his people. But there are two other people here in this text that the story is primarily about. That would be, of course, Mordecai and Haman. And there they stand in considerable contrast to one another. I think we would all agree with that. Mordecai, humble, patient. He eventually is honored. He escaped execution. He experienced salvation, and he experienced exaltation. That is the story of Mordecai. In fact, he, he not only experienced exaltation, it says that nothing would empower, I'm sorry, overpower him. He's really indestructible is what we're told in the text. That's the story of Mordecai, and his enemies would fall before him. Now, Haman, flip over. Haman is selfish, of course. He sought the approval of other people. Like he just, he wanted the the honor of other people like no other wanted the honor. He had a lot of accolades. He had a lot of assets in his life. But you know what he didn't have? He didn't have peace. He didn't have any peace in his life. It says here in the text, he walked away with his head down. He's mourning. The thing about all the stuff he has, well, he's got bling. House, car, money, he got got all of it. But he's walking around with his head down, he's mourning, and he's headed for destruction. Two completely opposite stories. But here's where this connects. Mordecai represents the followers of Jesus, and Haman represents those who oppose Jesus the rule and reign of Jesus in their lives. For all who humble themselves and confess they are sinners like Haman. Our natural self really should be identifying a lot more with Haman in the story than with Mordecai. For those who humble themselves and confess their great sin. And they honor God by their faith and their belief in Jesus Christ, his life, his death, and resurrection. You know what happens for people who do that? He puts royal robes on you. He treats us like a king. He proclaims to all of the world I love this person. They're mine. Give them great honor. They honor me. I honor them. This is what King Jesus does for all of those who humble themselves. And when we do that, we escape death like Mordecai. We experience salvation and exaltation just like Mordecai. We will have ultimate victory over all of our enemies and nothing will overpower us the gates of hell will not prevail against the church that is the good news of the gospel in the middle of this book christ is our greatest providence y'all he's the greatest good god has ever given to us in our world and in him we can have confidence in that would be remiss if I didn't mention Haman those who oppose Jesus' rule and reign who are prideful they their lives are consumed with being liked by people seeking accolades asset the approval of all of those people those people who refuse to honor God by receiving Jesus Christ, listen, they will walk around their whole lives and ultimately they will have their heads head down in mourning because they don't have a soul satisfaction in them. It doesn't matter what they have. It doesn't matter what kind of car they drive, what kind of house they have. It doesn't matter how good their yard looks and their grass is cut. It doesn't matter how many kids they have and their 401k. It doesn't matter. If you don't have Jesus... You will live your life with your head down in mourning. And just like Haman, eventually you will be headed for destruction. 
what will you do? Michael and the band are going to come up, and uh, I just want to tell you today before I leave, today, God offers the greatest gift of his providence to all people here today. That is the gift of his one and only son. I pray that today that everyone would know that providence, to know that goodness of the Lord. Because if you never get another good thing from God in your life, or at least it doesn't feel that way, you will still have the goodness of the Lord. You have the promise of exaltation one day in glory. Let me pray for us today. Father, your word is perfect. It's true. I pray above all things today, if anyone would remember anything that I've said, I pray that it would be the word that they remember. The power is in your words, not in mine. And so I pray that today, by your word and by your spirit in your people, you would put a a supernatural comfort and confidence inside of Life Point College Grove in 2024 today. I pray that the people in College Grove would see a comfort and a confidence in these people, that it would be attractive to them, that they might say, why are you the way that you are? And I pray that they would give you much glory and they would tell them of the goodness of Jesus Christ that gives them confidence. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Work in your people today. In Christ's name, amen.